So you want to play X-Wing. You grabbed your mat, your templates, your obstacles, ships, cards, dials, dice, tokens, credits, Darksaber. Wait, that can't be right. Let's actually break this game down because this is a lot. Star Wars X-Wing The Miniatures Game is a tabletop space combat game where you and your opponent engage in starfighter battles spanning the Star Wars timelines. The original version, known as 1.0, released with silver boxes for the original and sequel trilogies. This included pilot skills, or initiative values, of 1 through 9, and upgrade slots and points printed on the cards. 2.0 introduced with the black box and changed the initiative system to 1 through 6. It also removed the points and upgrade slots from the cards, which allowed developers to make adjustments as needed to maintain the balance of the game. You can still use the ships from 1.0, as not all have been reprinted in 2.0. Conversion kits were released by faction, with new dials, pilot and upgrade cards, and ship tokens. After ownership of X-Wing was transferred to AMG, they released a new rule set known as 2.5, which changed the focus of the game from a dogfight to an objective-based format with different rules for squad building. All components from 2.0 can be used in 2.5. There are seven factions in the game. Each squadron will be built from only one faction. Some ships, such as the Fire Spray, can be used in multiple factions. The factions are the Republic, with Jedi such as Anakin and Obi-Wan. The Confederacy of Independent Systems, or CIS, with droid fighters and Sith, such as Count Dooku and Darth Maul. The Rebels, led by Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. The Imperials, with Darth Vader leading his various TIE fighters. The Resistance has Rey and Poe Dameron. The First Order, with Kylo Ren and his merciless First Order TIEs. And finally, the Scum and Villainy, with Boba Fett, Bosk, and Mando. <laughs> X-Wing Legacy continues to be developed by X2PO, an unofficial organization of longtime passionate X-Wing players. Whether you are playing against friends on your kitchen table or competing in a tournament at your local game store, our hope is to keep the game alive and accessible to all no matter which format you choose to play. The battlefield in X-Wing is any 3 foot by 3 foot surface. This can be an official or third party game mat, or any other way to define the perimeter with tape, cardboard, or plywood. There are three types of cards, pilot and upgrade cards, which will be covered in more detail in just a minute, and damage cards, which are dealt face down for a hit, or face up for a critical hit. The smaller deck comes in the starter kits. Optional faction-specific damage decks are available. The maneuver templates are tools used to move your ships around the battlefield. The range rulers determine if an enemy ship is in attack range, and if either attacker or defender gets a bonus. Templates from 1.0 are not usable in 2.0 or 2.5 because they lack the center line. A player attacks or defends with red or green dice respectively. Some tournaments award alternate color scheme dice as prizes. Obstacles come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but can be broken down to three main types. Asteroids, debris, and gas clouds. Each has a different effect if a ship passes through, lands on, or shoots through them as defined in the rules reference guide. Each player will choose three at the beginning of the game, and one player cannot choose two of the exact same obstacle. Let's talk about the ships. Each ship is made up of the miniature, the base, and the ship token. When it comes to movement and hitting obstacles or other ships, the base is all that matters, including the small nubs. The ship token also identifies the firing arc, where a ship can engage from. Some ships, such as our medium-based TIE Heavy, have an arc that can be moved, Others, like the large base gauntlet, have multiple firing arcs to choose from. Dials are how players secretly select their moves during the planning phase. When you buy any of the ships or conversion kits, they will come with a cardboard dial. The rest of the dials in this video look slightly different because they have the optional dial upgrade kit, which provides a plastic backing for a little bit of protection to the maneuver dial. To select a maneuver, simply turn the dial until the selected maneuver is under the indicator. On the cardboard dials, the indicator is the white mark at the top of the dial. Tokens can be divided into two types. First, ship resource tokens, which represent force, shields, or other charges. When these are used, the token is flipped to the red side. The other tokens are status tokens. These represent focus, evade, or jam actions, or if your pilot is stressed. The rule of thumb is that round tokens are removed at the end phase. Square tokens stay. Pilot cards tell you what each ship's abilities are and how tough it is. 
On the right side of every pilot card is a faction symbol. Some pilots are able to fly in multiple factions, so make sure you have the one that matches the rest of your squadron. The ship silhouette and name is at the bottom of the card. Some pilots, like Darth Vader, can fly multiple ships. Across the middle of the card is the pilot name and initiative. Initiative indicates the order in which the pilot will move and engage. It ranges from 1 through 6. Some pilots have a dot next to their name. This indicates that the pilot is limited, and you can have only one of that pilot or crew member with that name in your squadron. The ISB Jingoist has two dots, indicating you can have up to two in your squadron. Pilot ability is the special ability of this specific pilot. The ship ability is an ability that all pilots on a certain ship have. In this case, every pilot for the TIE Advanced X-1 has the advanced targeting computer. The stat block tells you how tough a ship is. Ships may have all or some of these. The red number tells you how many red dice are rolled for a primary attack. The green number is how many defense dice are rolled. The yellow number represents how much hull a ship has, or how many hits the ship can take before it is destroyed. The blue number is how many shields a ship starts with. The purple represents how many force charges a ship starts with. The small pip indicates that this is a recurring charge, so, at the end phase, Darth Vader will get one force charge back. There are also negative recurring charges, which point down and remove a charge during the end phase. Lastly, the action bar shows what actions are available for a ship to take. Symbols in red cause the ship to gain a stress token. Symbols in purple require a force to be spent. For Darth Vader, we can take a focus action, followed by an optional red barrel roll. We can take a target lock, or we can just perform a barrel roll. There are numerous upgrades that can be equipped, ranging from crew members to shields to additional weapons and even additional ways to use the force. The same rules for limited pilots apply to limited upgrades. Each upgrade is assigned to a category. Pilots are allowed a limited number of upgrade slots from certain categories. These symbols can be found on points documents that are released periodically and are updated in the Legacy Squad Builder. How do we actually build our squadron? Each ship and upgrade is assigned a point value, or price. The more powerful the ship, pilot, or upgrade, the higher the cost. In a standard X-Wing 2.0 game, each player is allowed a maximum of 200 points. You could take the points document and do the math and build your squadron that way, but why work so hard? This is a game, it's supposed to be fun. Luckily, the crew over at xwinglegacy.com have created a squad builder where you select your faction, choose a pilot, and it will not only calculate the points for you, but show you what upgrade each pilot can equip and add those points to the total. Once you have their squadron completed, you can select Print or Export, and you are given a number of ways to share the list that you have built. This is important for competitive play because it provides you with point totals and the threshold or requirement for a ship to be considered at half health and what those points would be as well. Each list is made up of a minimum of two ships and a maximum of eight ships. The number of ships you fly is completely up to you. There are a few major archetypes that you may come across. One is the swarm. This is usually seven to eight lower initiative ships that fly together and try to overwhelm their opponent by the sheer number of dice thrown. On the other side of the spectrum are the aces, where it is generally two to three very high initiative pilots that rely heavily on moving second to minimize how many times they are shot. You'll see a lot of ships that deal quite a bit of damage, but cannot take very much in return. They are the proverbial glass cannons. One way that your list can help ensure that you are able to move second is by what is called a bid. This is where you will not use a number of points from your maximum of 200. The larger the bid, the more likely you are to have the power to decide. However, those are upgrades that may not have been equipped. You might ask, if my opponent has a 10 point bid, does that mean I can only score 190 points? Of course not. Once you get the first of your opponent's ships below half health, which is half of their combined hull and shields rounded up, you will score the half points of the ship rounded up. If their ship was 31 points, you would score 16 points, plus their bid of 10 points for a total of 26. This was the first of the rules developed and implemented by the X-Wing Legacy team. The other rule that was developed and implemented by the team is that even if your opponent has the ability to regenerate health or shields to bring them back above half health, those points are still yours. Now it's time to actually start playing the game. First, we have to figure out who will be the first player. Both players compare their list, and the player with the least amount of points, or the largest bid, gets to choose who the first player will be. In our instance, we have 198 points. Our opponent has 199 points. 
we elect to let the opponent become first player. Both players place their three obstacles on the side of the table, and then we'll alternate placing any of the obstacles onto the play area. All parts of the obstacle must be placed at or greater than range 2 from all board edges, and at or greater than range 1 from any other obstacles. Players now begin placing their forces. Player 1 will place all of their Initiative 1 pilots, then Player 2 will place their Initiative 1 pilots. Players continue placing forces by initiative until all forces have been placed. When a ship is placed, it does not have to face straight ahead. Any orientation is allowed so long as all parts of the base are within range 1 of that player's board edge. The exception to this is for large ships that, if placed on a diagonal, may extend past range 1 of the board edge so long as part of that base is touching that player's board edge. Once a ship is placed and your opponent begins placing their ships, you cannot go back and move or adjust your ships unless your opponent agrees to the change. Each round of X-Wing is broken into five phases. It may sound like a lot, but once you start playing, it flows very naturally. First is the planning phase. In this phase, players decide what maneuver their ships will perform this round. This is done by secretly turning the dial for each ship so that the selected maneuver is under the indicator and placing the dial face down near the ship that dial is assigned to in the play area. The phase ends when both players agree they are ready. Until then, you may pick up and change any of your dials. If a ship is not assigned a dial during this phase, when that ship activates, it will perform what is called the stress maneuver, which is a white speed 2 straight. If you are not expecting this, you might land on an asteroid or even fly off the board. The maneuvers in white are normal difficulty, with no special effects. Blue maneuvers remove one stress, one strain, and one deplete token if any are present. Red maneuvers cause the ship to gain one stress token, and purple maneuvers require one force to be spent. A ship that is already stressed cannot perform red maneuvers. If a ship that has a stress token reveals a red maneuver, or if it reveals a purple maneuver and does not have a force token to spend, then that ship executes the stress maneuver. <laughs> Now we will demonstrate what each of these maneuvers look like. To execute a maneuver, simply place the template in the front guides of the ship, hold the template, move the ship to the opposite end, and align the rear guides. The first maneuver that we will execute is the straight maneuver, and we will show you all of the speeds available for each of these maneuvers. One thing to note, while moving in a straight line, the speed of one is equivalent to the distance of one small base ship. The next maneuver we'll execute is the bank. A bank will turn your ship 45 degrees. The next maneuver is the turn. This repositions the ship with a 90 degree turn, either left or right. Now we will demonstrate the advanced maneuvers. First is the Koyogren turn, or K turn for short. At the end of your straight maneuver, your ship will execute a 180 degree turn. The second advanced maneuver is Segnar's loop, or S loop. At the end of your 45 degree bank maneuver, you will execute a 180 degree turn as you did for a K turn. The final maneuver demonstrated is the talon roll. With the talon roll, you will use your turn template. At the end of your turn, you will rotate 90 degrees to the inside of the turn. The second phase is the system phase. Not every ship will have an ability that occurs during the system phase. The most common abilities are dropping or launching of bombs and mines like those on your screen, performing a decloak action, or deploying and docking ships. If you or your opponents have system phase abilities, the first player will start with their Initiative 1 pilots, then the second player. Then player 1 will begin with their Initiative 2 pilots, and the second player, and so on until all ships have completed. If a player has multiple ships of the same initiative performing abilities, then that player chooses which order they will perform their abilities. Next is the activation phase. In this phase, just like the order from the system phase, each ship activates one at a time starting with the lowest initiative. To activate, the dial is flipped face up and the maneuver executed. After the maneuver, assuming the ship did not hit or land on an obstacle or another ship and does not have a stress token, 
it may perform an action from their action bar. You must finish the entire activation phase for one ship, including the perform action step before activating the next ship, because you are not allowed to go back later. Now we move to the engagement phase. During the engagement phase, each ship engages one at a time starting with the highest initiative and continues in descending order. When a ship engages, it may perform an attack. This is an important way of phrasing this. Certain abilities and critical damage cards have effects that state, when a ship engages. This does not mean that it can be avoided by not performing an attack. Every ship engages even if it does not attack. To perform an attack, the player announces that the ship will attack. Then, that player can measure using the range rule to identify any possible targets in range. Because none of the ships in our game are within range, we'll skip ahead a few turns to demonstrate the engagement phase. Remember, this is a game of millimeters, and if any part of the enemy ship's base, no matter how small, is within range, that ship is considered to be at that range. Range is measured by the closest point of an enemy ship that is within the attacking ship's arc. Which arc is used is dependent on the ship's weapons available. Range 1 is most beneficial to the attacker, providing the attacker with one additional die. Range 3 is most beneficial to the defender, providing the defender with an additional defense die. After validating range, the attacker rolls the attack dice. The dice may then be modified, first by the defender, then the attacker. Common ways to modify dice are by using the force, spending focus tokens, or by spending a target lock. Next, the defender rolls their evade dice. The dice are modified first by the attacker, then by the defender, and then we compare the results. Each evade result cancels a hit or crit result. Hit results are canceled first. Any hits or crits that are not evaded deal damage, first to shields, and then as damage cards to the ship. Hits are dealt face down, and crits are dealt face up. It is possible for critical damage to compound each other, so fully resolve one card and any effects before dealing subsequent cards. Lastly is the end phase. You will resolve any abilities that say at the start of the end phase, then abilities that say during the end phase. Then round tokens will be removed, square tokens will stay, and recurring charges are replenished or deducted. Then we go back to the planning phase to start the next round. So how does the game end? The base rules say to play until one side has no ships remaining. This can result in a game that drags on a very long time with one person running away to try and save their last ship. The tournament rules, which most of the game nights at local game stores use, and many prefer for their own home games, put a time limit of 75 minutes on the game. If time expires in the middle of a round, players finish the current round before calculating scores. The rule of thumb is that if the dials are down and players have begun their system phase, that round is considered started. If players are still setting dials, then the game is over. The time limit gives incentive to keep the pressure on your opponent and not run away because the winner is determined by the number of points scored. Points are scored by getting your opponent's ships below half of their total health, both hull and shields. Then, the rest of the points for that ship are scored if the ship is destroyed. Now, there is a rare situation where the game ends and both players have scored the exact same number of points. If this happens, it's time for a final salvo. The details on this can be found in the tournament regulations. So, what is the future of Legacy X-Wing? In addition to keeping the points updated, the team at X2PO have already adapted new ships released by AMG, as well as the Battle of Yavin and Siege of Coruscant scenario packs, and they've even introduced a new mode called Wild Space. Head on over to x2po.org for more information. Thank you for watching, and we hope that this has ignited the spark for X-Wing the Miniatures game. Please continue to watch the rest of this round, and may the Force be with you.